Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Chrysler World Engine and how it works. Now the World Series of Engines was co-developed with Hyundai and Chrysler and you'll see a lot of similarities between this and the Hyundai engines that I've taken apart before. This here is a 2 liter 4 cylinder engine out of a Dodge Caliber. Taking a quick look around this engine, we've got a plastic valve cover over here followed by an aluminum head and an aluminum block. Here we've got the water pump which leads to a crossover tube that runs under the exhaust manifold and under the front of the engine we have a timing chain. Around the back here you'll see we've got the four ignition coils at the top here I've got some wiring I need to remove of course we've got the mandatory engine hook because we know these engines fail so often and we'll have to get swap out then we have this giant plastic mess over here of a coolant manifold that has your outlets for your heater hoses radiator hoses and the thermostat inlet at the front of the engine we've got more plastic with this intake manifold now this engine is port injection only you don't have to worry about carbon buildup and the oil filter is located down here now whoever had this engine before me is just like me because they use this green tape to mark things off and they've also got their brother's t-shirt in here to block off the throttle body of course we got more plastic at the front here with these idlers i'm surprised this engine mount isn't also made of plastic apparently this engine was running when pulled so i'm just going to go ahead and take off these wiring harnesses making sure not to damage anything all right i got most of the wiring harness loose and out of the way now i can work on removing this intake manifold these are just a bunch of 13 mils all right now i'm going to remove the intake on the intake here you can see these little flaps it's controlled by this electric motor that's just a tumble control valve to help mix the air at higher speed in addition with a throttle body would bolt up we have our pcv valve connection here all right next up i'm going to remove the ignition coils from the top here pop off those ignition coils these are all in good shape now i'm going to remove all the eight millimeter bolts that hold this plastic valve cover on So this one's rounded out and one thing we're already noticing with all these Chrysler fasteners is just how rusty they are. You wouldn't see this on any Japanese make vehicle. I think it's just the coating that they're using is making them rust up. That doesn't scream good quality to me at all. And now we should be able to knock off this valve cover. Not much to see other than a really brittle seal here. Alright, taking a look under the valve cover, you can see we have a dual overhead cam design with these two cam phasers here for variable valve timing and the respective oil control solenoids. This is driven off of a timing chain. Now this engine didn't really fail, so there's nothing traumatic to see here, but it is very similar in layout to the Hyundai Sonata engine that I took apart a while back. So you're going to have to mind the noise because my neighbor is currently destroying their house in the background. Next up, I'm going to be working on the front half of this engine here so we can get the timing cover off. Got a bunch of 16s holding this engine mount on. So they press the bearing into this plastic. Let's get the belt tensioner off here. Now right, let's get the dipstick tube out of the way. Lock off these two bolts that hold this big bracket on. Nice hunk of aluminum. We got a bunch of 14s holding this front bracket on. this off this is just a bracket holder for the tensioner see if we can get this crank bolt off of the impact first yeah, no way. all right we're gonna move to the exhaust manifold next and i think these are supposed to be 10 millimeter bolts but they're so rusty that one's stripped out okay so we're three for one hammer on a nine mil All right, got the bolt out. Now I can remove the exhaust manifold. The exhaust manifold is held on by a bunch of 13 millimeter rusty bolts. All right, so since the impact isn't cutting it, I gotta break this free with the breaker bar. All right, finally, let's take off these nuts. And of course, the bracket bolts are a different size. These are 16. All right, now we can open this off. You can see it's got this interesting slot over here where the bolts bolt into. It's not a continuous piece. Check this out, the exhaust manifold did not cover these two bolts over here. And those two bolts are threaded in the block, but there was no bolt in them. So probably this head has been used on different models, like ones with a turbocharger, that actually make use of those two bolt holes. All right, next up, we're gonna be working on the water pump, which is driven off of the crankshaft. Look at the ground strap that Chrysler uses. It looks like paper. Water pump bolts are actually a 12 mil. Chrysler seems to be using all different kinds of fasteners on this engine. And the impeller is also made of plastic. Now, as you see, the water pump is not directly connected to the block. It's got this coolant crossover tube. So we're going to go ahead and remove these 12s that hold it to the block. Right off. Okay, so there is two connections here to the block. Price is really pulling a Volkswagen here by using different fasteners for the same part. We've got 8mm, 10mm, and 13mm holding this heat shield on. 
The engine hook is held on by a 13. Coming back to this coolant manifold here. It's just a giant piece of plastic and you can see the thermostat here. Okay, uh, we're gonna try something. I put the flywheel back on and I stuck a bolt through there. Let's see if I can get that crank off. Yes! Next up, we're gonna tackle this timing cover. 10 millimeter and 12 millimeter bolts holding it all together. From the oil pan side, there's a bunch of 13. You always forget this middle 10 millimeter bolt. Now the timing cover should be free. Yep, that's the inside of the timing cover. And we have a good look at the timing chain side of this Chrysler engine. Here you can see we've got the dual variable valve timing at the top here. And that's the crankshaft at the bottom there, followed by plastic timing chain guides. We've got a hydraulic tensioner at the bottom here, followed by an oil pump down inside of the oil pan, driven by its own timing chain. I'm just going to knock off these camshaft bolts here. And now using a 10 mil, I'm going to release the timing chain guides. You can see this guide here is completely made of plastic. Now I'm going to remove the tensioner. And here's a closer look at that hydraulic tensioner. It's got that ratchet mechanism on there that holds the tension. This one too is made of plastic. You can get the chains off here. These are your variable valve timing gears. And here's what the chain looks like. Now at the top here, you can see we have the cam caps. So we're gonna knock off all these 10 millimeter bolts. Now you can see these are just aluminum caps. There's no extra bearings inside of there. And they're not completely worn out, but you can definitely see a little bit of lines. So this engine did have a little bit of mileage. Next, we're gonna remove the 12 millimeter bolts at the head here. Here you can see the double channels for the variable valve timing. So here we've got the camshafts removed. You can see there's not particularly a lot of wear on the camshafts area, but it definitely has a few lines from higher mileage. Head bolts are T55 Torx. All right, now we're gonna zip those bolts off. Taking a look under the head here, you can see we've got the pistons. We've got a little bit of carbon buildup on them, as well as the coolant jacket here's got a little bit of crust on it. But overall, things are looking all intact. Here you can see the ports that are going to drain back oil from the head down into the sump. The gasket they've been using is also intact. They're using a multi-layer steel design. Right, I'm going to try to rotate the engine upside down so we can work on the bottom end. Of course, we made a lot of mess on the ground, so I've got my brother's old sweater here. I'm going to go ahead and sap that up. So here we are at the oil pan. It's actually made of stamped steel and not plastic, which I'm surprised. Now they do have a bunch of different fasteners here. We got 12 millimeters and then 10 millimeters that go all the way around. Notice how these fastener heads are also really rusty. Indicates pretty bad quality to me. Now someone's definitely resealed this oil pan with RTV. So I'm gonna have to break it free. And here's a look inside of that oil pan. Yeah, things look pretty grimy actually. I thought this was a good working engine, but there's a lot of sludge and particles inside of here. Although it doesn't look shiny to indicate that there's metal particles in here. Oh yeah, and there's a lot of RTV around here. You don't need that much when you're resealing these. Now, I don't remember if I drained this engine, but there's a lot of oil built up inside of these little holes here. I'm just gonna use another t-shirt here to sap those up before I turn this engine back over and it spills all over my driveway again. I'm actually surprised that Dodge Chrysler is using a balance shaft assembly at the back here, which is integrated into the oil pump driven off of this chain. That also means that this chain needs to be timed, not just like an oil pump. As I get towards the internal structure of this engine, I notice they're using more standard fasteners, like 10 and 12 millimeter, as opposed to eight and 13 millimeter, which we found more on the outside. All right, let's bust this free. So these fasteners are actually pretty loose and it's just taking up the impact from the rattle gun. That's why they're not coming out. Alright, we're just going to have to do this the old school way. Okay, now that they're completely loose, I can zip them off. Looks like they had some kind of thread locker or something on them. This one's full of oil. This one's dry. Ah, it's got a messed up thread on there. 
and this one's dry as well. All right, so here's two things I think they did wrong here. First of all, this fastener here is way too loose in this hole. This hole should have been machined at least a millimeter smaller, so it fits nice and snug. Also, it's a really skinny and long fastener that has to go down really deep into the block. That's just a recipe to make these fasteners snap off really easily because they're so thin. I would have rather they thicken up the fasteners and use more of them going all the way around this assembly. All right, I'm gonna pull off a couple of tens here. Once again, we've got plastic guides. Pull off this tent here for the oil pump. This is also a hydraulic tensioner, just like the timing chain going to the cam. And we've got another plastic guide over here. I can pull off that oil pump gear and the little chain. So wherever this fell out of, it's actually an oil filter. Catch the oil debris and you can see it's actually pretty dirty. It's got a lot of grime in there. You can pull off the oil pump and balancer assembly. So here's the balance shaft assembly. You can see there's a lot of sludge inside of here. I guess this motor is just high mileage and really tired. But that's not looking good for the health of the engine. Although it was running. Here you can see the two gears for the balance shafts. They spin in opposite directions to each other. And there's counterweights inside of here. To counter the vibration of the engine. And the whole thing here is driven off that oil pump gear that we took off. Now this unit also has an oil pump assembly up at the front here. Where it's going to draw in oil from this pickup area over here it has a screen inside oh and i can see there's some crumbs inside of there too yeah things aren't looking good for the health of this engine it's going to then supply that oil flow over here on the block taking a look at the upper oil pan here you can see it's got some nice cross bracing but there's not that many fasteners just some that run along here and here they don't actually bolt directly to the main bearings which are down below in order to strengthen the bottom end of this a little bit more they should have connected the two so that it would make this like kind of a ladder frame design all right let's see if we can get these 12 millimeter bolts out all the way around the perimeter all right so i'm just going to break some of them free here all right now i should be able to remove this off so here we've got the bottom end of this 2 liter engine. Now things are looking pretty simple. Now because this is a low horsepower engine, we've only got two bolts on the main cap bearings at the bottom here. And there's five total main cap bearings. Now here we've got the connecting rod bolts. These are a 10 millimeter 12 point socket. So here's just what the rod caps look like. There's no bearings in them. Looks like they've taken some heat. I'm going to knock these pistons out of here. Now taking a look at these pistons here, the first thing I notice is that the wrist pin doesn't rotate as freely for its full swing. It's really sticky near the end here. You kind of have to free it up. And I notice a lot of piston slap wear on the skirts of the piston here. Where it's hitting the side of the block as it goes up and down. On piston number two, same thing over here. And number three, also the same thing. This one is really sticky. Actually super sticky. As I notice there is carbon buildup on all of these pistons. And the oil control rings are almost clogged. There's just a tiny bit of room inside of there. This engine definitely had a bit of higher mileage. And here's piston number four with the worst piston slap. Now we're going to remove the main cap bolts. These are 14 millimeter. Once again, internally it seems like they're following Hyundai's lead and using standard size fasteners as opposed to like a 13 here. Oh, even the head bolts weren't this tight, jeez. I'm gonna remove these main bearing caps here. Honestly, these don't even look that bad. All right, now I can lift off the crankshaft. And the main bearings do have a couple of lines on them indicating that there was some wear. And the connecting rod bearings are just about the same with just a couple of lines of wear. Now looking at this big hunk of crankshaft, it's got a bit of weight to it. You can see here, we've just like any four-cylinder engine, it's in a flat plane layout. where you got two pistons on this side over here, and the opposite two pistons are over on this side with their counterbalance. And at the front here, we have our timing gear. Now the gear that's pressed on over here is actually for the crankshaft position sensor, not actually to drive the oil pump. All right, I'm gonna get this engine off the stand. So now that we got everything taken apart from this 2 liter 4 banger, let's take a closer look at how it works. And we're going to start here at the upper oil pan. Now there's not too much to see other than to see its shape. This kind of acts like a baffle because there isn't really an oil baffle at the bottom of the engine. Now looking underneath here, you'll see the oil pump is going to plug into here and send oil straight up to the oil filter to get filtered out. Now they've got a good Mobile One oil filter on here. You ever wonder what it's like to take off an oil filter with an impact? Let's see what happens. 
Oh, it's not that hard. I mean, here's what the oil filter looks like. Oh, it actually looks pretty clean on the inside. There's no grums or anything. Turning this back over, the oil is then going to be sent out to this hole, which will go into the block. There is no oil cooler on this engine. Taking a look at the block, you'll see that the design is actually very similar to the Hyundai Theta engines that I've taken apart before. Although this one is not nearly as problematic because those ones are more due to a manufacturing related issue. The oil from the upper oil pan is then going to be sent down through here and then into this central galley that runs along the length of the block here. The main bearings here are then going to be drilled and tapped down into those over here where it's going to lubricate the crankshaft and connecting rod bearing. Now looking at the front of the engine where the timing setup would be, you'll see that hole there where they've drilled in to get to that center galley. There also is a tap over here that's going to feed the hydraulic tensioner for the timing chain that goes to the camshaft. And of course we've got these bosses over here to support the engine mount on the passenger side. Now over here on the side of the engine we've got a coolant temperature sensor and two knock sensors over here for pre-detonation. Now there's that hole again that the galley was drilled into. You'll also see that this hole lines up with it because this is where the oil goes into the head for lubrication. Taking a look under the head here, things are in good condition. You can see that the combustion chambers are not completely black or filled with carbon and none of the valves look like they've been regapped or burnt out. Now the bottom of the head here is where you can see the oil is going to be received from the block to the head. Now if you follow that oil path you'll see that it will feed the oil control valves for the variable valve timing system on both the intake and exhaust side. Taking a look at the top of the head here things are very simple mechanically speaking. It does use a bucket style with the camshaft directly acting on the valve springs over here so you will need a valve adjustment because these are not hydraulically adjustable once this engine does wear out but to be honest the rest of the car is probably going to wear out before this. Looking down and behind the valves here you can see things are actually pretty clean there's not too many carbon deposits inside of there that's the result of just using port injection only you don't have to deal with cleaning off the back of these valves all right now we're going to take apart this oil pump and balance shaft assembly you take apart you? that battery bro all right looks like i'm going to have to break these free by hand dang definitely someone from jiffy Lou was in i mean rightfully so this thing needs to be tight it's the balance shaft Here we are. Oh. oh, there's oil. In the oil pump? No way. My brother taught me this. You gotta flip over your shirts when they get dirty on the outside. And then, sap that up. Put this oil pump assembly on top. Pop this off. Here you can see the oil pump assembly. Here's the gear that sits inside. And when they rotate together, you can see how it creates fluid flow. How this works is you've got your pickup screen over here. That's gonna bring oil up to the front here where the oil pump lives in this cavity over here. And that oil pump's gonna spin up and create fluid flow. And then that's going to send oil through this cavity over here out to the upper oil pan. Continuing over here, there's a balance shaft assembly. You can see that the weights here rotate in opposite directions to each other. And that's to counter the secondary forces that come from the crankshaft to try to quiet things down because this is more of a passenger vehicle as opposed to being a machine. Looking inside of here there is a bit of wear on these bearings for the balance shaft assembly. And that's a wrap on the 2 liter Chrysler World engine. As you can see the internals are just like any other 4 cylinder engine and will definitely outlast the rest of the vehicles that these are attached to as they've been pretty known for CVT failures, suspension failures amongst other things. It's really the bolt on parts such as all these plastics and literally these rusty bolts that really condemn this engine from being a good one. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one. Are you going to rebuild it? Now before you ask, I scrap all the engines that I use because I can't guarantee that they're going to be working. Are you going to rebuild it?